Hello. First of all, I welcome you all in this YCB level three course. So three point six, three point seven, three point eight, and three point nine, ten. These six, uh, these four to five points, we are going to discuss with reference to psychology and its relation with yoga. Before starting, I would like to express my deep sense of gratitude towards respected uh, Guruji, Mr. Gandhar Sir, Purnima Tai, and even Aishwarya Zushi Madam for giving me this opportunity to share some thoughts on psychology with you, renowned people. So 3.6 first, we are going to discuss about introduction to psychology, then the cognition, its types, process, meaning, and nature of what exactly mean by cognition. So, and even motivation, human motivation system, and, it's, uh, and with reference to emotion as well. So before starting, already, as we have discussed in our level two, what exactly mean by psychology, its definition, and so many aspects of it, importance. Also, we are going to discuss definitions, emotional expressions, even biological changes, psychological health and yogic perspective. To start with, the word psychology, it is originated with two Greek terms called as psyche and logis. Psyche means mind and logis means science. So scientific study of mind is what is psychology. Broadly and very much uh, easy, concise particular definition of psychology is psychology is the scientific study of human and animal behavior. Now, some of us may have thought that how can we study our mind scientifically? Because means when we use the word science or scientific study, we need some object to see, to conduct some experiments, to have a particular you know, conclusions on it. But even today, in 21st world, our mind, our psyche, it is not visible. We cannot see and we cannot show it to others. Then how come to study this invisible thing scientifically? As we have discussed in Invisible Level 2, that some of the components of mind, they are traceable. Like for example, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions, even memory, forgetting, needs, desires. With all these particular components, our mind reflects, our intentions, our psyche reflects. And these particular parameters of our mind, they are, you know, uh, they, they can be objectively studied. We have a particular standardized psychological test through which we can study the components of mind. And remember that all these components, they are applicable to all human beings. However, frequency, duration, and intensity, it will differ from person to person. Everybody's thoughts are not same. Everybody's emotions, it may not be same. But emotion as a component of mind, it is applicable to all of us. So they have used the word scientific study. Now, another thought, another, a particular question, it may arise that it's okay to study human behavior, but how far it is possible or why we should study animal behavior? The answer for this particular thought that all the time it is not possible to conduct each and every experiment only on human beings. Some experiments we have to conduct on animals and then we can use that particular analogy to human beings. 
and that's why scientists they have experimented some particular parameters on animals it can be on dog rats pigeons so many animals have been studied for scientific purpose only and then those findings have been applied to human behavior or human mind so the definition is psychology is the scientific study of human and animal behavior remember it is applicable to any topic that if you study any point from elaborative perspective initially you may find that you know some excessive time is investing but the output it will be have helpful for the longer run so that's why in the definition it is always suggested to study from elaborative perspective from deeper perspective so after moving a basic introduction to psychology so next it comes that is objectives or goals of psychology each and every subject has some goals some objectives to study it helps us to understand that while studying that particular field and after studying what exactly we should be able to understand or learn so for psychology we have four goals or objectives the first one is explanation of a behavior scientific study of psychology will help you to explain a particular behavior because in day to day term it happens that generally we label the person he is naughty she is mischievous he is idiot or uh, he he is not interested in in study he is quite hyperactive she is depressed also we become judgmental on the contrary scientific study of psychology helps us to understand and explain the behavior being naughty means exactly what how far you are able to explain the behavior because if you are able to explain the behavior that means you are able to notice even minor changes in that particular behavior and that's why psychology it is a deeper study it is not a particular superficial study so study of psychology will help you to explain the behavior in a detailed manner if you are able to explain the behavior then you will be able to understand and describe the behavior explanation and description both are two different terms description in the sense ability to analyze and think about cause and effect relationship ability to understand the antecedent behavior and the consequences in terms of behavioristic perspective it is called as applied behavior analysis what exactly has happened or occurred earlier so that particular wanted or unwanted behavior we have seen and if it is seen then in which particular context or what particular consequences it has led up so what has happened earlier the behavior and the consequences of that particular behavior antecedent behavior and consequences cause and effect relationship that help you to describe the behavior and if you are able to describe the behavior from this analytical perspective then it will really add in your perception of understanding that person if we see. according to rebt rational emotive behavior therapy which is coined by dr albert ellis he said that do not judge the person on his actions rather try to understand the belief system or perception of that person 
behind that particular action. Then only you will be able to understand the person in a true sense. That's why description of a behavior, it is important. The third goal or objective of psychology is prediction of a behavior. So if you are able to analyze the behavior that which particular thing is responsible for that particular wanted or unwanted behavior, then in future, you will be able to predict the behavior that if A is happening, then in nearby time frame, that B is also going to be there. To control unwanted behavior and to enhance and to support the behavior, you must be able to predict a person's behavior, how he will act, how he will behave in future in a given situation. Psychology will help you to understand this. And then fourth thing, it's controlling the behavior. How far understanding of this subject will help you to control the behavior if it is inappropriate, unwanted and undesired. If it is expected and if it is correct, appropriate behavior, how can you promote or how can you give some reinforcement so that the occurrence of that particular behavior, it will get strengthened. In that context, controlling word has been used here. So these four goals help you to understand a person, person's mindset and his given set of actions. So after discussing origin of psychology, the definition and objectives, let's start with history of psychology, history and even perspectives. Understanding the history of any field, it is essential because this study helps us to understand that what work has been done so far in that particular field. And it has also said that without canvas, we cannot paint the picture. So understanding the history helps you to understand the depth of that particular subject. Earlier, psychology means, of course, if human being it is there, then mind and psyche has to be there. So earlier also, study of mind, it was there, but in earlier era, it was completely from philosophical perspective. In India also, most of the people, even today, they have a thought that psychology, it is nothing but uh, you know whatever has has been said or mentioned in uh, in uh, Gita, Kuna, uh, Quran, Bible, also it is absolutely true. But considering Western perspective, they have separated psychology from philosophy because earlier Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Epictetus, all these great thinkers, philosophers, they have spoke about our mind. Epictetus, he had said that uh, it is not outside event or people which makes us disturb, but it is the view which we take towards them. If we are able to change our perception, then definitely we are able to change the person or ourselves. Aristotle, rather, he has written entire book on mind called as The Anima. But this entire writing, it is completely based from philosophical perspective of mind. In 1879, William Wundt, he separated psychology from philosophy and he started first psychology lab in Germany, Leipzigberg University, where he started to study the terms like reaction time, reflex actions and all. According to him, if you truly want to study your mind, it is always better to, to study the structure of your mind. Now, how can we study our structure? So he said that 
introspection, it is the best way to study your structure of mind. Even Swami Vivekananda, he has also said once that, talk to yourself at least once in a day, otherwise you will miss the beautiful conversation in the world. If you are able to have a word with ourselves, then after a couple of weeks, definitely we will be we will be able to understand our structure. Am I really introvert or extrovert? Am I really able to, you know, plan my routine, work activities or so? And what exactly purpose or goal am I able to set for myself? at least month, year, or for life at large. I need to understand my structure first, then only I can understand the rest of the thing in the world. So, William Wundt in 1879, he coined the term structuralism to understand Dharma. In year by decade, in America, in US, William James, he was also studying the concept of mind, but with a different perspective. According to William James in US, instead of studying structure of mind, it's always better to understand the functions of mind, how exactly our mind works or act. Functionalism. If we are able to understand our functions, definitely we, we will be able to understand ourselves. For example, Emotions, if we say, in day-to-day -day life, now scientists, they have, you know, come up with a figure that daily we express and experience more than 30 to 40 emotions. So many shades are there. So many different, different, you know, varieties of emotions are there. This is how our mind acts or work, functions. Same thing with your, uh, with her thoughts, constructive thought, positive, negative, inductive, deductive, logical, creative, fundamental. So many types of thinking are there. Same thing with actions, overt, overt actions. So it is always better to understand the function of our mind, according to William James in US. Then a decade pass and then 19th century, first 20 years, it was highly discussed only because of Sigmund Freud's concept of psychoanalysis, is ego, super ego. I'm sure you might have heard the term uh, that conscious mind, subconscious mind, unconscious mind. So conscious in the sense, the things about which we are aware right now, about today's day, day, the lecture which we are attending or seeing right now, we are conscious, pre-conscious or subconscious. Things are there, but we are not able to, uh, you know, Im immediately have easy access for it. Like some academic things or, you know, mathematical particular calculations we have heard, listened, studied earlier. So conscious mind, pre-conscious mind and unconscious in the sense are suppressed thoughts, emotions, actions. Sigmund Freud also uh, spoke about psychosexual stages of development. According to him, between the age of two to three years, boy, is getting sexually attracted towards his mother and a girl is getting sexually attracted towards her father. Why and how it is so? With the help of some Greek, you know, mythological stories, symbolic stories, Sigmund Freud explained this point in his theory called as psychoanalysis, psychosexual stages of personality development. So he said that first five to seven years are so crucial for child's development of a personality. The way parents treat, you know, their children 
that matters a lot. We are the victims of our past according to Freud, which of course, the rest of the psychologists, they, 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 they you know, criticize this uh, point and then they develop their own independent uh, theory of personality development. But in this way, Sigmund Freud gave the popularity of psychology. In between, another stream it emerged called as Gestalt Psychology. So Gestalt, it is a German term. If you see now, yes, the first line, it can be read either in second way or in third way. God is nowhere, now here for some people and for some people God is nowhere. It is entirely depend on the way you perceive. Object, it is just neutral. Your perception reflects your psychology. Your perception reflects about your mentality in simple term if we say. If you change your perception, your situation, your surrounding, it will get changed for you because you are changing your dimension. Moving ahead, even people in between realized, understood, and it has been also explored that psychology, it is not only, uh, you know, uh, just a chit chat topic, but yes, it has also have some biological and scientific perspective, cultural perspective, social perspective. The combination of this group of so many things called as bio, psycho, socio, cultural approach. Like physical particular you know, characteristics we receive from one generation to another, with research it has been found that Psychological characteristics also we receive from generations to generation. Genetic part, it is there. It can be about intelligence, it can be about you know temperament, it can be about any other thing. Genes also matters, biological structure, it plays important role. Social factors, so we have separate field called as social psychology, which studies Cognitive dissonance also. How far the discrepancy between thoughts and actions reflects and how it matters. Social psychology. The principle of obedience. Why and how we follow the orders given by our authority even if personally we didn't like it. Social part. Even cultural upbringing and surroundings also affects our psyche or mindset. Further, with the limitations of psychoanalysis and gestalt, another emerge of a you know, different uh, wave that is behaviorism in the history of psychology a major force. The basic theme of behaviorism is if you change the environment, your behavior will get changed. Their entire focus is on the changing the circumstances. So automatically your behavior, your reactions, your set of patterns, it gets changed. So classical conditioning, operant conditioning and observational learning, these are the three core principles of behaviorism. The first one, it was studied by Ivan Pavlov. Classical conditioning. This experiment, it is known to all of us, I hope, that how he, he conditioned his, his dog just because of repeated exposure to particular things. In simple term, as we say, the things you get habituated to do in a similar manner or in a particular manner. Earlier, the dog was not conditioned to give any response to the whistle. 
but just because consistent pairing of whistle with food dog become habituated and conditioned to give response to that whistle also. Same principle is applicable even in addiction, either drinks, smoking, nowadays internet addiction, binge watching addiction and all. Even this is the basic fundamental principle, how we train our students in yoga class, how to condition with yogic healthy practices. This classical conditioning, it will help you to work on this in a more easy manner. So classical conditioning studied by Ivan Pavlov and operant conditioning particular principle based on law of effect. Law of effect in the sense, I am able to judge myself or I am able to give particular response by considering the end results and consequences of that behavior. So Skinner, Hondai, they experimented this phenomena on hungry rat, sorry, cat. As the hungry cat was placed in, into that cage, she used to do some random movements. And once eventually, accidentally, she pressed that liver, she used to get out of it. With repeated practice, repeated, you know, trial, she understood that if we may, uh, if she makes some random movements, so then means there is no uh, escape for her. But no matter what, the moment she used to press the lever, she immediately find, or she was able to find her way to get out of it. Psychologists applied the same logic to human behavior also, that we judge ourselves or we tend to give direction to ourselves based on the consequences, considering the effect of that particular desired or undesired behavior. And then observational learning, it has been studied by Albert Bandura. It is also named as social, uh, social learning approach where he experimented that how even three to four year old child, just by observing others, just by imitating others, he can display that particular behavior. So observation plays important role. And this point having larger applications to parents, media, teachers, that's how they, uh, how they give a room or how they behave in front of their children. Next course, it was about humanistic perspective. It is given by Abraham Maslow and Carl Roger. Carl Roger, he spoke about real self-concept and ideal self-concept. According to Roger, if there is maximum gap between who you are and what you want to be, who you are right now, is your real self-concept and what you want to be is your ideal self-concept. So if there is maximum gap between real self and ideal self, it will create stress, tension, anger, anxiety issues for individual. On the contrary, if your real self-concept and ideal self-concept quite goes hand in hand, that means you have quite realistic perception and understanding of yourself. So Roger said that first understand yourself, acknowledge yourself and accept yourself the way you are. Then only you can move ahead. In between Abraham Maslow, he raised a point that if we are a true psychologist, then why we should study only and only the negative aspects of human behavior. Means according to him, so there are, of course, healthy individuals in our society. We should study the healthy psyche as well. And therefore, I think in 1940s or in 1950s, he studied, he interviewed more than 1,000 
Americans. And then he come up with this pyramid, hierarchy of needs. According to him, physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, self-esteem, this is the hierarchy of needs. Our entire behavior, all the set of actions are totally centralized focus just to fulfill the physiological needs. Hunger, thirst, sleep, shelter, these things. Once we are able to have that particular assurance that yes, we are and we will be able to fulfill our you know, physiological needs, then only we can think about to satisfy our safety needs. Safety in our job, safety again with reference to our home, shelter and so on. Once we are able to fulfill and have that assurance of safety needs, then only we can move to love and belongingness need. Again, love in uh, means to love and to be loved. It is a psychological need according to Maslow. Need for affiliation, it is also important need. After all, man is a social animal, as we say. And then it comes self-esteem need. Till the age of 40s, 50s or so, through so many struggles, sufferings and our ups and downs and so we have achieved something. And at this particular time, individual expects some kind of respect from him and from others as well. It is need for him. At any at uh, any of this phase, if individuals, any one of the need is not getting fulfilled, then individual becomes psychologically disturbed according to Maslow. And then he said, only 1% of our world, they are able to reach, they are able to experience, they are able to fulfill the last need called as self-actualization. However, when he updated his theory in second phase, he said that all individuals have the ability to at least partially experience what exactly mean by self-actualization. In the sense, he said that uh, means whatever task which we are doing, if we are able to engross ourselves into it, if we are able to just throw ourselves into it, and if we are able to enjoy that thing that can be considered as self-actualization because we are quite happy. We have thought of being, you know, creative, spontaneous, having approach to solve the problems. We are able to enjoy that thing. So it is called as self-actualization. And then another force, it emerged in psychology called as Cognitivism or cognitive perspective. In Hindi, as we say, that Sabse Bada Rog, Kya Kahenge Char Rog. We get so much disturbed, so much nervous, tense, just by thinking about others, how they will judge me, how they will think about me, or what kind of image or perception they are going to frame. As per my appearance, my speech, my gesture also. Aaron Bain and Albert Ellis. These two people studied this perspective called as cognitive perspective. For them, it's not the environment which is responsible, but rather the perception which we take towards them. Aaron Bain, he spoke, uh, he, he has given some five core dimensions of inappropriate thinking called as cognitive distortions. Mm -hmm. Magnification, minimization, personalization, abstraction. So magnification in the sense, in real, the loss is quite small in nature, but person tends to exaggerate the loss. That is, he is magnifying the loss. And on the contrary, in reality, since whatever the positive things are, are there, some individuals have habit to reduce the intensity of it. They tend to ignore, they tend 
to avoid to see the positive things. So called as minimization. And personalization, it is associated with guilty feeling. For each and every loss, individual feels or blames himself. Abstraction in the sense having no objective relation between two things. I just not get selected in that exam because that exam occur on Friday and that Friday, it is not lucky day for me. So I failed. So I didn't get, you know, uh, selected. This particular approach, some individuals have. And that's why CBT, REBT, uh, it, it helps a lot in counseling session to, to work on this type of people. And then another force, it emerged called as existential perspective or logotherapy. It is given by Viktor Frankl, a Jew psychiatrist. Who was a sufferer in Auschwitz, Auschwitz camp. But the way he survived and the way he came out of it, based on his experiences and his personal study, he has written a book, Search for Meaning. This one book has been translated in more than 180 languages until the day. Thousands and lakhs and crores of copies have been sold, uh, sold. According to him, individuals do suffer from stress, tension, anger, anxiety and depression also just because he is not able to find the meaning for his life. If individual is able to find the meaning of his life, then he will face ups and downs. Striving to find a meaning in one's life is the primary motivational force for human being. So the term is their existential perspective. Being exist means exactly what? So that's why if you see the journey of Western psychology, it is also from more objective to more subjective. From more you know, materialistic to more philosophical in nature. The journey helps us to understand and to have some introspectory thought about ourselves, about our life. And that's why study of psychology it is so important. And then some other fields also nowadays they are emerging like even Vipassana, the positive psychology, being mindfulness means exactly what, emotional intelligence, EQ and all. So now psychology is, uh, it is uh, even PNI, it is also there. That is psychoneuroimmunology. It is uh, so the, the field of psychology, it is growing, it is developing, evolving like anything. So in this way, so far, we have discussed the field of psychology definition concept, approaches, goals, streams, so many perspectives and other aspects. Now moving on to second half of this uh, segment that is consciousness, motivation and emotion. Conscious as we have discussed earlier that is being aware being aware means exactly what Ulrich Neisser, he has defined consciousness as cognitive process. All processes by which, now see the wordings, the sensory input is transformed, reduced, elaborated, stored, recovered and used. It is concerned with these you know, with these processes, even when they operate in the absence of relevant stimulation. America, it is not there in front of us, in front of us, but, but still, we can think about, you know, US, its locations, its lifestyle, ideology, surroundings, and so many things. 
it occurs when they operate in the absence of relevant stimulation as in images or in and hallucinations. So there are more than 10 to 12 core fields or domains of cognitive psychology. So what are they? Like attention, memory, language, thoughts, concept formation, imagination, sensation, developmental psychology, it is also related with the cognitive perspective because the milestone speaks a lot about brain development. Human intelligence, as we know, and nowadays AI, it is, you know, quite boom in nature. Artificial intelligence, then knowledge representation and even neuropsychology. Attention has been conceptually defined as purposeful mental activity is what is attention. How far we are able to concentrate, how far we are able to, you know, memorize the things, how far we are able to control our forgetting nature. In attention again, so we have some types that is selective attention, divided attention. Even memory, sensory, short term, long term, autobiographical memory, flash bulb memory, episodic memory, even procedural memory. So many types of memories are there. Through research now, it has been found that there is scientific relation between what we think and the language which we use. Thinking and language goes hand in hand. And that becomes our belief system or belief pattern. The research has said that we speak to ourselves minimum five to six hundred words per minute. Five to six hundred words per minute. See language, thoughts, attention, even memory, imagination, how all these things are interrelated. And that's why they says that be conscious about your thought process. Be conscious about your intentions. Be conscious about your actions. Because that that reflects, that speaks about you who you are and what kind of structure of bringing you are having. That's why. And then another approach that is motivation. So motivation, this particular word, it is originated from to move to move in the sense having some movement. And then we, we say that uh, he is our motivation, she is my inspiration and so. That means after seeing that particular person, we are able to take, we are able to experience some physical and emotional changes in ourselves. So we say that it is our motivation, inspiration. In motivation also, again broadly we have two types, internal motivating factor and external motivating factor. Internal motivating factor in the sense, the factors which we value a lot. It can be any anything, but it is related with internal motivating factors. Finding a meaning in life is internal motivating factor. Seeing some particular opportunity in adversity is our internal motivating factor. On the contrary, doing a job just for your money, salary, it is also reward. It is also, you know, motivation, but it is called as external motivating factor because you are able to guide yourself just because of that outer perspective, outer stimulus. If you are working only for appreciation, recognition, admiration, praise or so, it is also considered as external motivating factors. In a way, so you are making yourself dependent on some external rewards. So the factors that direct and energize the behavior, see, factors that direct and energize the behavior of humans and other organisms 
called as motivation. Psychologists scientifically they have also presented study the biological perspective of emotion and motivation. So with reference to uh, 3.8 and 9, in detail this part we are going to see that how emotion and motivation affects and directs our brain. Thalamus, hypothalamus. Now because it is related, so let's say that uh, hippocampus, it works for storage of long-term memories. Some people are able to recall the positive things or negative things of their past just because of activeness of hippocampus. We feel to uh, hungry because of activation of hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, it works for our, you know, basic needs and instincts. So after having a lunch, after three to four hours, we feel quite hungry because hypothalamus gives us a signal to take concrete action to satisfy and to fulfill ourselves from hunger perspective. Amygdala, thalamus, limbic system, also called as emotional brain, it works as per you, as per you know their respective functions. Hormonal changes also related with emotion and motivation. The speed flow of neurotransmitters also matters a lot. And then comes with types of motivation. Physical motivation we have, social motivation, general motivation. If you see here, the circle of motivation or cycle that is Without need, you cannot experience the motivation. Hunger, it is a need. Once you strongly feel that something is lacking, then only you tend to take a particular action on it. So need stimulates the drive. Need in the sense what? Having a strong realization and understanding that yes, you are lacking in something. That need has to be experienced. I need to learn yoga. I need to have my fitness. I need to have calmness in my life. Then only we can search some ways, alternatives for it. So once we feel driven to achieve it, then we start thinking for some incentives. So getting a food, lunch, dinner to satisfy our hunger, uh, hunger Sorry, it is called as incentives. Food, it is incentive in that case. It can be sweet, it can be spicy. Once we are able to experience incentives after uh, you know fulfilling the drive, then we feel that yes, we have reached to our goal and now we are feeling content, relaxed. Then after again four hours. We, we start experiencing the need to fulfill our another thing. So it is a complete, uh, it is, it is a vicious circle, cycle of being, you know, motivated. And then broadly speaking, these three types of motivations are their physical, social, and general motivation, physical in the sense, hunger, thirst, sleep, even six, it is also physical need, physical, you know, motivation. How to regulate your motivation, how to, you know, channelize those particular needs without insulting and cheating other, that reflects the skills, that reflects being human means what. Same thing with social motivation, need for affiliation, need for aggression, and for some specific, you know, political people. These people have need for power. They want to rule others, they want to you know, control others. They want to have some kind of dictatorship in their tenure, like ones. General motivation means like and moments, having, you know, curious thoughts. thoughts. 
and then yes uh, as per maslow's theory already we have discussed that how need drives us need you know pushes to take a particular action in some specific and desired way the characteristics of motivation if we say yes the motivation has some power consistency really matters if we are having you know variations in it then we feel more you know motivated otherwise after a point we may get uh, less interest uh, less interested and less you know motivated to to uh, achieve a particular thing objectivity and goal orientation thought process it is so important a chinese uh, you know proverb says that uh, if you fail to plan you plan to fail planning objectivity some kind of you know determination has to be there earlier respected our president our president dr apj abdul kalam once he had said that low aim is a crime setting a low aim or low goal it is a crime so motivation helps us to have higher goal to have higher aspirations and in that way again automatically we become selective if to study is my goal to study is my you know motivational factor then i become selective and choosing with my thought process i will not hang out with my friends late in night i become selective as yes i have to i need to study because it is my you know motivation source of inspiration that yes i i uh, have to secure good marks good score in this exam or in this particular course so in this way briefly we have discussed about introduction to psychology its definition greek terms origins history the motivation concept its definition cycle types and so many things related with uh, you know ycb objective pattern in this way you can make your notes psychology means exactly what in brief you can write it down who has coined the term structuralism functionalism associated with whom psychoanalysis key people persons in in behaviorism humanistic or cognitivism existential perspective and likewise i hope you you have followed this lecture in next session we are going to discuss about emotions means exactly what emotional intelligence means what and how far psychology can be considered from yogic perspective and mental health so that part we will discuss in our next session thank you so much hari om